This week on The Communicators, a look at how those in the information technology field are viewing the 2008 presidential elections. Our guest is Roger Cacchetti with the Computing Technology Industry Association. In this election year, many groups are looking at the presidential candidates and issues surrounding the presidential contest. Specifically, we're taking a look at a group in the information technology field this week on The Communicators. To that extent, we're joined by Roger Cochetti. He is the computer. He's the public policy director for the Computer Te Computing Technology Industry Association. Welcome to the Communicator, sir. Thank you, Pedro. I'm glad to be here. To an extent, you took a survey of your folks in the field. What were you looking for as far as information from them? Uh, Pedro, I think we were looking for two things. First, to identify the IT workforce as an important emerging voting block in the United States. It's been talked about vaguely described, but our goal primarily was to say, who are these people? What are they like? How large a voting block is this? What are its political uh, uh, views and orientation? And then secondly, to find out what positions it takes on specific issues and candidates. So suggest, that suggests that that's never been done before? It really hasn't. We've looked pretty widely to um, see if we could determine whether anybody has documented or established in a reliable way the size of the IT workforce as a voting block, and very little has been done in this. There's been a fair amount of rhetoric, but very little genuine research. You know, you hear the word, term IT worker. What exactly does that mean, and who does that define? It's a good question, and it kind of goes to the heart of one of the reasons it's been difficult to, for people to get their hands on this. Historically, um, the category of IT worker has been classified by third parties, professional third parties, who say you are a computer programmer, you're a software engineer, you're a hardware, this, that, or the other thing. And um, typically, for example, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a set of categories that it calls IT workers. Uh, these are professional classifications that people fall into. But that really says nothing about how many voters consider themselves to be an IT worker. And in electoral politics, the question is not whether the Bureau of Labor Statistics classifies you as a farmer. The question is, do you think of yourself as a farmer? Because that'll determine how you vote. The same is true for IT workers. So our approach to this was to determine how many American voters consider themselves to be IT workers, and the results were surprising. Were the, was there a disparity in numbers as far as what the Bureau of Labor Statistics identified as IT workers compared to what you found as far as numbers are concerned? Absolutely, an enormous difference. And, and uh, again, this is in no way a criticism of BLS. They do a professional job of classifying people who work in professions, and that's what their responsibility is. Our question was completely different. How many workers think of themselves each day as being an IT worker? The Bureau of Labor Statistics estimates that by these professional classifications, there are about 3 million American voters who are IT workers. Uh, when we asked voters, how do you classify yourself in a scientifically representative way, um, the numbers came out to be closer to 12 million. So we, we, we estimate that about one of every eight American workers today um, uh, classifies themselves as an IT worker. Are they in the DC metro area or are they all around the world? Uh, this is, the, the survey was, was nationwide. The survey was conducted, um, it, the, the survey yielding this data was, but was conducted really over a six month period for us by uh, Rasmussen Reports Limited, a professional survey firm. And they're pretty confident that the results are accurate to within 4% plus or minus. So uh, to this group, you posed a question if the 2008 presidential election were held today. You asked who would get the vote. And what did the results show? The results, I think, were a bit surprising to us. Um, we, you know, the, Obviously, there's a lot more about the group than who they support for president. But, the two, but both um, Senator McCain and Senator Obama came in at an exact dead heat, each getting... 29 percent. This survey, by the way, was conducted on the eve of uh, Super Tuesday, just before the March primary. So at that time, um, Governor Huckabee and uh, Congressman Paul were still active candidates, so they were included in the, in the survey group. But among the three active candidates remaining today, um, Obama and McCain each got 29 percent, and Senator Clinton got 13 percent. So if you had to look at specific whys, why the ranking? I would say another of the more surprising things we found out about the IT workforce as a, as a, a, a voting block, as an influential group in the elections, was that it is relatively wealthy and it is relatively politically active, far more than anyone ever thought. 
Um, and I think it's its its sense of independence um, more than anything else that resulted in the support that we see for the presidential candidates. And did they specifically tell you that I'm voting for this person because of specific issues in my industry? We did. We did ask the question. We we asked the question: um, Why do you support the candidate who you support? Um, so we, we asked sort of what are the factors that go into your thinking. And we intend to continue these surveys as the election goes on and learn more about this voting bloc. But the, um, the answer came out to be the number one factor was the position that the candidate takes on specific issues. The number two factor was vision. And number three factor was al amalgam of other. And number four was experience. So we could tell that at least for this voting group, um, the specific positions that candidates take and their vision are the two most important things. You looked at, uh, when you asked them, you said specific policies, you asked visions, but when you asked about interest in the tech sector, tech sector, 1% responded. What That's does true. that mean? Uh, you know, I think, it, I think it means that as a, as a voting group, um, they don't put uh, tech issues at the top of their agenda in deciding how they're going to vote for president. And that's true of lots of voting groups. Um, and, and, and it's not clear to me that that, 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 that low, relatively low response sort of tells the whole story because um, the question we asked was their degree of interest in the tech sector. But clearly, um, when we ask them, what are the issues that you think are most important for the next president, their issue priorities came out pretty clearly. And they're not tech issues at the top of their agenda for the purposes of presidential elections. And you asked issues about the economy, or at least the issues about facing the next president. Nothing surprising there as far as uh, the first two categories, but immigration was uh, on this list as well. Yeah, I think when you compare the response of the IT workforce to the response of the general public in what are the issues you think are most important for the next president, they follow each other pretty closely. The you know, economy is number one, the war in Iraq is number two. But number three shifts slightly. Um, for comparable polls, it's often health care um, or other issues of that sort. Um, for the IT workers, the third issue was immigration, and health care came down as a, as a fourth or, or, or lower issue. Dep depending on the person you ask for, immigration means different things. That's what do you exactly think it right. means for the uh, IT worker? Well, I think, it, I th uh, we, you know, we don't know the answer to that. We, we suspect, and we'll find out more as we continue these surveys, that it means two different things. First of all, many of them say, I'm an immigrant, or the guy next to me is an immigrant. This place is held together by immigration. I understand that immigration is an important ingredient to the success of the IT workforce. And for others, I'm sure it means, you know, the, the, the Mexican border and, and uh, you know, illegal aliens in the United States, undocumented aliens getting, you know, public benefits or, or whatnot. So the answer is we really don't know what was meant by the broad category. Um, and I suspect we'll find that it means lots of different things. Does that also mean in the broader category of immigration, because your industry relies on a, a certain type of visa, does that get folded into the immigration discussion as far as visas are concerned, specifically the H-1B visa? Yeah, I think absolutely yes. I'm not sure that every IT worker understands the uh, intricacies of the H-1B classification and the quotas that go with it. But I am sure that uh, the overwhelming majority of, of, of IT workers understand that um, immigrants are making an important contribution to the IT workforce and to the IT industry. You simply can't miss it. You simply, you, 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 if you look around the workplace, you will see it and, and come to appreciate it. So, uh, you know, how much importance they assign to that, who knows? We'll try to find out in future surveys. But I don't doubt that, that uh, most IT workers recognize that as a factor. Uh, as far as taking a look at the, the visa issue, um, you asked that more of information about surveys are going to come out. Did you ask specifically about visa policy or how many foreign tech, uh, technology workers come into the United States? Yeah, no, we did not. And, and when, when we did this this uh, survey of the of the IT workforce, we we didn't go we didn't drill down into this issue, and we're, that's something we will look at more closely in future surveys. Get back to that in a second. But one of the other things you also asked about is who contributed to presidential campaigns via the right. internet. Probably the single biggest surprise, at least to me and for most of us who looked at it, was the propensity of IT workers to make contributions to presidential campaigns. We asked, have you made a contribution via the Internet to a presidential campaign? Now, by way of background, it's important to understand that the, the statistics that are available and the general population are a little bit different. They ask, 
the, the Federal Elections Commission documents how many Americans in this election cycle have made contributions of $200 or more on any medium whatsoever. But still, the, 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 the result of the FEC data is that about uh, 0.28 of 1%, or about a quarter of 1%, of Americans make contributions of $200 or more to presidential campaigns. Um, the results for the IT workers were 100 times greater than that. 27% um, uh, uh, of the respondents indicated that they had made a contribution to a presidential campaign. This is shattering in terms of anybody's view of this, of this segment, which has widely been thought of as relatively politically inactive. Um, it puts it up there with the very top ranks of, of campaign contrib contributing uh, voting blocks, um, trial lawyers or whatnot. And I think the difference is, instead of there being a few hundred thousand IT workers, we're talking about 12 million IT workers um, with, uh, with an evident inclination to contribute to campaigns, to presidential campaigns, of 25%. Uh, this, is, this is a massive influence on presidential politics as time goes on. Stepping aside from the actual survey and as you look at a presidential year and because you represent the industry, uh, what are the main issues as far as your organization is concerned going into a presidential year and when you look at candidates and, and can cons consider candidates, what are you looking at? I think, uh, again, th thank you for the question, uh, Pablo Pedro, because we, uh, the group for which I work, the Computing Technology Industry Association, represents the IT industry. So. This was a survey of IT workers, mm -hmm. and, and now you're really asking me to speak for, for the IT industry. Not that there's a great difference. In fact, we found very few differences, but it is a slightly different perspective. Um, for the companies who are members of CompTIA, uh, which are hardware, software, systems, large companies, value-added resellers, VARs, and, and many others, um, we have about four or five issues that we think are important as we um, uh, approach the 08 elections. Um, first, um, I think uh, just about everyone in the industry recognizes that broadband uh, deployment is key to the future of IT and uh, I think to some extent the health of the entire U.S. economy. Um, so we're quite concerned about what the candidates think should be done to encourage um, broadband deployment. Um, second, you've already mentioned um, the, the, the workforce issues and, and, and we would include in workforce issues not just the H-1B visa, which is important for those very special, highly qualified workers, but also IT training um, and uh, the uh, federal programs that support um, uh, training people for IT workers, such as Trade Adjustment Assistance and Workforce Investment Act. For us, it's very important that the federal government make a strong commitment to train inner city, uh, rural, and other uh, adults and, and children in, in IT. Thirdly, um, I just put in a broad category regulating the Internet. Um, I, in general, I would say, and there are, there are important differences within our, among our members and within the IT industry, but in general, the industry has a strong preference to minimize government regulation of the Internet. I think most people believe that one of the reasons the medium has been so successful is that the barriers to entry are minimal, and anybody who wants to try something out can do it, and there's not a lot of red tape. Um, fourthly, I think um, research and development um, is very important to the IT industry and providing tax incentives for research and development, specifically the R&D tax credit, um, are a, a critical part of, uh, a, of the sort of policy agenda for us. So as an industry, we take those issues as, as our principal issues. I think the IT workforce recognizes every single one of those issues, but probably not with the precision that, that industry representatives would, would as well. Back to Visa, if I may, uh, what, uh, how important is it for your industry to have workers who can get an H-1B visa? I think it's absolutely critical and um, I think, you know, not many employers would go through the effort uh, and the expense of, of applying for an H-1B visa um, if there wasn't a, a, a good reason for that employee to fit in. Typically what happens is you assemble, and I've, and I've spent most of my career working in the IT industry. Um, typically what happens is you assemble a team of people to work on a project, and you need certain skills. Uh, you know, you could compare it in, in everyday terms to, I need an electrician, I need a plumber, I need a carpenter, I need such and such. But very often what you need is somebody who can do a particular kind of software, a particular kind of hardware, a particular kind of design activity. 
And um, to the extent that you can recruit those people in the United States, you will clearly prefer to do so. Your cost of doing so, every other factor is less. But w when you can't, or when it becomes virtually impossible to hire the person you need in the United States because the cost of, of, of getting them from their current employer is exorbitant, then you look to um, overseas sources. So I, I know of very few employers, uh, if any, I really don't, you know, probably at some time decades ago, there may have been some companies who preferred overseas employers or non-American employees, but today that simply doesn't happen. And, and, and th there's a common myth that somehow you pay less for people who are non-American. The reality is every one of these IT workers knows that there's a global marketplace for IT workers. If they're willing to relocate to California or Texas or North Carolina, they're willing to relocate to Seoul or Malaysia or Singapore or, or Hong Kong. So uh, you know the, 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 there's nobody there's no free ride in this. You're 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 paying for talent. So I think for that reason, it's filling in those holes that the that the H-1B visas become important. One of the people who made the, that case was on Capitol Hill a, a few weeks ago. It was Bill Gates of Microsoft. Here's a little bit of what he had to say about the issue. But as you know, our immigration system makes it very difficult for U.S. firms to hire highly skilled foreign workers. Last year at Microsoft, we were unable to obtain H-1B visas for over a third of our foreign-born candidates. An example is the story of our Pete Guglani, a talented young man who graduated from the University of Toronto. He graduated in 2006 and we offered him a job, but he has not been able to attain an H-1B visa for two straight years and we were forced to rescind his job offer. He's exactly the type of science and engineering graduate that we need to continue to add jobs and drive innovation. There are a number of steps that Congress and the White House should take to address this problem, including extending the period that foreign students can work here after graduation, increasing the current cap on H-1B visas, clearing a path to permanent residency for high-skilled foreign-born employees, eliminating per-country green card limits, and significantly increasing the annual number of green cards. I want to emphasize that to address the shortage of scientists and engineers, we must do both, reform our education system and our immigration policies. If we don't, American companies simply will not have the talent they need to innovate and compete. Mr. Cacetti, Mr. Gates talked about a cap on, on visas. How many visas are awarded to foreign workers coming into the United States on a yearly basis? In this category, the cap is 60,000, and, and that um, uh, quota is quickly overrun. The first day that the, that the gates are open to file for applications, um, two or three times that number of applications are received. So it's clear that there's a much greater demand. I did want to mention also, I thought, that Mr. Gates' comments about the importance of training the American workforce were extremely important and, and very important to us with the Computing Technology Industry Association. This is not just a matter of bringing foreigners in. We have a, what we think is a very balanced approach. In the long run, no one would be happier, I think, than the American um, industry if all of our employer uh, needs could be met by Americans. But that's not sim simply not going to happen anytime in the, in the foreseeable future. Why is that? Is, uh, are they not just getting specialized training? Well, I think for two reasons. First, you, you find that oftentimes you need a very special skill. You need something which is just, you know, there, there are only a dozen people on the planet who understand this and can work with it. And there are two of them in the United States, and they're both already making a lot of money and very happy in the jobs that they have. So at that point, you either, as an employer, you either say, well, I either give up on the project, I try to hire the, one of those two people away and spend a fortune, um, or I move my production overseas. I mean, it's, it's, that, it's that simple. So um, for those employers who want to stay in the United States, being able to bring in those very specialized skills are necessary. For the, 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 so, so some of those will always be there. There will always be circumstances where, if you're looking for the very specialized or rare skill, you, 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 you'll want to search the planet to get the best people coming here. Other skills where there may be a, a shortage of, of a broad skill are a matter of, of education and training. And, and um, here again, this is where the government can do a lot to put greater emphasis on science um, and math education 
which then leads to the development of those skills later on. Uh, would you, I guess, advocate for to let to increase the cap of workers who come in on the visa, or or keep it at at, at its current pace? No, we clearly support uh, what I think of the, the the industry broad view is that that cap should be significantly increased. Sixty thousand simply doesn't capture the number of people you need to 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 keep the IT industry in the United States. It will force IT companies to move to other locations to get the skills that they need. Now you talked about the issue, but I'm sure you hear the old argument that maybe employers aren't looking hard enough within the United States to find these workers. Yeah, I think, you know, you, uh, any employer who, uh, you know, first of all, to go through the H-1B process is expensive and time-consuming. So it's, it's very illogical to think that somebody would do this just for fun or, you know, because they like the uh, last name of somebody from a country other than the United States. Um, you do this because there's a real need to, 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 to do it. You don't do it because you save much money because these people can get a job in Singapore or Hong Kong or, you, you know, uh, Israel or elsewhere anytime they want. So I don't think, you know, I think there's some misunderstanding about what, what's going on here. If the U.S. training centers and if the U.S. universities provided a sufficient supply of the kind of people you needed there's no question but that you wouldn't take the time and effort to, to recruit somebody from a different country to and bring them and relocate them here and go through all of the, the expense and disruption of that to, to fill the position. Um, I, we need to do more in the United States, obviously, and that will reduce the demand. It'll never go away as long as you want to get the very best people here in the United States. Um, you'll never want to change that. but. Uh, you could reduce the demand by increasing the U.S. supply. One more point on the, on the visa. Senator Grassley, Charles Grassley in the Congress, a, a very big critic of the visa program. And one of the things is after Mr. Gates appeared, he sent a letter. I don't want to, you to answer to Mr. Gates, but one of the points he makes is that he's afraid that taking away the cap will simply benefit foreign-based companies. And according to an article on a Business Week uh, article, foreign outsourcers topped the list of companies bringing four workers on the H-1B uh, B program. And he said six of the top visa recipients are based in other countries. So I guess his concern is that foreign companies are getting, you know, first crack access to take in, and take American jobs, if, I, if I'm paraphrasing. Well, I think, I, I, I think every American would prefer that a foreign company locate its operations in the United States, pay U.S. taxes, hire Americans, support the U.S. system, keep technology here. If, if, and I haven't read the senator's letter, but if Senator Grassley is suggesting that we are better off if those foreign companies locate their operations and employees in other countries outside the United States, that's hardly credible. I think that the, you know, to, it, to the extent that uh, bringing in a small percentage of your workforce from outside the United States provides you with the catalyst you need to locate an operation here and hire Americans to do things, as a country, we're far better off for doing that. Uh, you talked about the education process and all this. Uh, what would you advocate as far as increasing the, the amount of uh, technical people within the United States that could take jobs uh, related to your industry? Yeah, I think there, there, there's no question. Just about all the research on this has shown that um, this all begins in the primary schools. And, and, and at the primary level, you develop an interest in and an aptitude for math and science. And, and, and as that grows, the, um, the, the child and the student um, begins to develop the ability to learn more and to make a contribution into the field of, of, uh, of engineering. And, and IT is one important, but not the only part of, of what people do as engineers. Um, and I think the, the, the result of that is that if you want more uh, PhDs in the area of IT or more trained people in the area of IT to come out at the, at the uh, 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 end of the process, you need to have more people with a math and science aptitude going into the process. And, and that leads to a myriad of questions, the quality and the uh, size of the teaching force in the United States that's devoted to math and science, the amount of resources that are put into uh, math and science um, education at the primary and, and secondary level. Um, you know, these all need to be strengthened so that we have, and, and this is exactly, by the way, what has happened already in countries like China and India and Singapore where massive commitments have been made to improve and increase aptitude and interest in science and math at the primary level, leading to a bulge in workers who are um, technically competent uh, as they graduate from high school or college. Do you see people on Capitol Hill recognizing that issue? And if that's the case, what are, they, what are proposals uh, to kind of change that? Well, I think w w we were astonished and impressed by um, uh, the President's State of the Union speech last year 
um, and the Democratic Party's innovation agenda, um, which came out at about the same time, because both the uh, Democratic and the Republican leadership um, indicated at the level of, of policy and broad uh, statements that they recognized this problem and they were committed to, um, uh, to addressing it. So we've been working with, uh, with leaders on both uh, the Republican and the Democratic side to move this innovation agenda or, or competitiveness agenda forward. Um, there are some differences in the priorities uh, that, that Republicans and Democrats take, but they both recognize the need to do more in math and science um, education. They have both recognize the need to do more in um, IT training. They both recognize the, the need to do more in research and development in the, in, in the science and technical and particular um, IT field. So what we need to do is translate these broad policy commitments into specific legislation. That has proven to be much more difficult than we thought. In the last two years, we started out with as, as good a policy commitment as you can get, and we've had to struggle mightily for the last two years to translate that into real dollars. Looking at the presidential candidates, the, say Senators Clinton, Obama, and uh, McCain, out of those three, who kind of reflects the main interests that um, the, the IT workers in your association uh, reflects the most? Is that, do, does one follow closely more than the others? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can honestly say that they are different, but not. I wouldn't describe one as being stronger in IT issues than the other. Senator McCain has been chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee. Um, Senator Clinton has been a very active supporter of the IT industry for her whole time um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Congress, and, and Senator uh, Obama has developed probably the greatest rapport with the IT industry in a short period of time, with the IT workforce in a short period of time, of anyone I've ever seen. So I don't, I don't think, I think we have a slightly different, if you look at their specific positions on issues, they are nuances of difference. And in a few cases, there are real differences, but by and large, their, their positions are pretty similar on the IT industry issues. So as the presidential year uh, goes on, What's your role as far as looking at the political side of it? What's yeah. your organization's role? I think the, the most important thing we intend to do is to begin is to continue the process of developing a better understanding of the IT workforce as an emerging voting block. I, I would describe this group as sort of beyond its childhood, but not yet in its adolescence. It's probably where auto workers were in in the period right after World War One. Kind of vaguely understand this is a group of people who are important. Uh, they're going to play a role in the future. Um, what we have with 12 million IT workers in the United States, uh, one of four of whom have said they contribute to presidential campaigns, is a very important, very powerful voting group that is relatively immature in its understanding of, of the influence it can have and, and what it can do with its, uh, with its influence. I think our goal at this time is to help candidates understand, the public understand, and, 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 and uh, the media understand um, that this is now one of the largest and most important voting groups in the United States. Roger Crocetti serves as the Public Policy Director for the Computing Technology Industry Association. Goes by the acronym of CompTIA. Right. Thanks for joining us on The Communicator. Thank you for having me.